started, get things kicked off this morning. Uh, great to see so many returning names and faces, folks that have joined us for previous I4CP Next Practices weekly events. Uh, as I've been saying, as folks were joining, if you could open up the chat, that'll be your opportunity to interact with us today. Uh, start by introducing yourself. Let us know where you're joining from today. I saw folks from all four corners of the United States. I saw Canada, India, the UK. We've got a global audience this morning. Uh, more folks will be coming in as they filter off their previous meetings. Uh, we always have a growing audience for the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, again, welcome to Next Practices Weekly from I4CP. If you're not familiar with us, we are the Institute for Corporate Productivity. We're your human capital research firm. Uh, we think we do more human capital research than anyone else out there. We are not a consulting company. We focus exclusively on research and peer connection. Great to have you with us here today. Of particular focus for us is trying to tease out what high-performance companies do differently than low-performing organizations. We define that by four common business metrics that you see here on the screen, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. And in our studies and in our interviews and case studies, we like to, again, tease out what those high performers are doing different, whether it's in DE&I, learning and development, talent acquisition, HR strategy, whatever the case may be. We are a member organization. You see here just a small sampling of our member companies. Uh, they range from very large companies like General Mills and Nike, Amazon 3M and others, to smaller, maybe regional banks, regional healthcare organizations. We've got a growing cohort of startups, unicorn companies as well. Uh, if you're with a member company and with us today, great to have you with us. Um, special shout out to you. If you're not with a member organization, but would like to learn more about what that entails, what the benefits are and so on, just reach out to anyone at I4CP or visit our website at i4cp.com and we can get you that information. My name's Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP. I have the pleasure most weeks of, uh, of, of co-hosting these sessions. Uh, I was off last week on some vacation, so it's good to be back. Uh, and this week, my co-host is my colleague, also a senior research analyst here at I4CP, Molly Lombardi. She's waving there uh, and she'll be grilled by me with some questions on a study she led on upskilling uh, in just a, in a few minutes. But a few other uh, quick announcements. Uh, as you can see, this is Next Practices Weekly. We've got upcoming sessions on the 22nd, the 29th, and then September 5th. We've got great guests lined up from Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Advocate Health, and then Dow Chemical. A couple of other quick reminders. Our Next Practices Now conference occurs every year in March in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Fairmont Princess. Uh, people start registering, frankly, the day after the previous conference. So we've already had many people register, but now we're in full swing for that. You can save $300 if you register by November 15th. This is a pretty unique conference. We get around 500 to 600 HR leaders at this conference. There's no expo hall, which means no vendors uh, to, to deal with in the hallways or otherwise. Um, Great conference. We usually have a range of speakers from CEOs and former CEOs, current CHROs and former chief people officers, and then leaders of each functional area of HR. Uh, we'll be announcing uh, the first raft of, of speakers coming out soon. So watch for that. And again, if you register by November 15th, you can save that $300. And then lastly, the other announcement I wanted to make, we've had this open now for a couple of weeks. We'll be closing it here pretty soon. Um, we're doing a, a sort of benchmarking survey on the function of people analytics in your HR organization. This is something we did a major study on several years ago, but really haven't hit on too, too much, at least not head on and in a focused way since then. So we wanted to circle back and get some, some data on where is people analytics today? And there's a lot going on with AI, obviously, that impacts all of HR, including people analytics. Um, but what are some of the just foundational statuses of, of how much predictive analytics is being done, how much advanced re reporting, how many insights on what topics. Um, so again, this is a, a quick survey, takes about 10 minutes. If you're the appropriate person in your organization to do it, please click the link uh, and do that after the call today. Uh, if you're not, if you're not a, a people analytics professional, but know who is in your organization, we'd love it if you could open that link and then share it with them later today. Um, we'd love to have every organization on the call today represented in this survey. And again, it only takes about 10 minutes and all participants will get the data in an aggregated report soon after we close the survey. All right, with that, uh, let's bring on my 
uh, co-worker, my colleague, fellow senior research analyst, Molly Lombardi, and let's have a conversation about upskilling frontline workers. Um, before we get to that topic, Molly, I'd, I'd love you to take this opportunity. Um, folks, you know, on this call, on other I4CP calls, they often don't know too much about who works at I4CP necessarily. Maybe they know a bit about Kevin Oakes, our CEO. Um, but take this opportunity, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your career in HR, what areas you've, you've specialized in. Yeah, well, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I've been with I4CP about two, uh, two years now, but I've known uh, Kevin Oakes and Kevin Martin for decades. I've known you for five or six years, Tom. So really happy to be here. I've been sort of in all areas of HR, all disciplines. I've looked at HR workforce management, time and attendance and scheduling. I've looked at talent acquisition and at learning. It's really the spectrum. But I think where I specialize is the intersection of HR technology and practice and strategy. So how do you actually use technology to implement strategy and unleash potential within organizations? I always say I can study technology in any realm. I do it in HR because on a good day, you can help individuals and companies get the best out of their people and make life better. So happy to be here and share that with you. And just as a little heads up to everyone on the phone, I also about 11 years ago was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And as a result, sometimes I get a little jittery or I get a little uh, fidgety on screen or my voice well, uh, speed will change a little little bit. So if that happens, don't worry, I'm not drunk, or maybe I totally am, and now you'll just never know. So <laughs> nice. You'll keep us guessing. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, thanks for that. Heads up. Um, but Molly, you're you're uh, you're too kind on yourself. Um, Molly came to us with a great reputation, a great uh, you know amount of sort of industry recognition and expertise in the HR tech space in particular. She was a frequent analyst at the HR tech conference each fall uh, in Vegas, which I know is coming up again uh, in about a month. Um, so great to have you with us, Molly. You and I have partnered on all of our HR tech studies covering HRIS, the TA stack, the L&D stack since you joined the organization. So it's been great working with you. Yeah, and I'm happy to be now looking at learning and upskilling and uh, how organizations are helping their people with that. Yeah, so with that, um, we had a poll that we wanted to start things off. I think we have two polls today, but let's let's go with this one first. So before we get into the, the findings of the study you led, um, do you believe that your current frontline workers have the skills needed to meet the demands of the organization over the next to five years? Give your best answer. Would you would you lean towards yes or would you lean towards no? This isn't a extent question. This isn't a how you know one through five rating. So you're having to pick yes or no, but where would you lean? And I'll just say while we're waiting for answers, this was a really important question as we did the analysis, because we wanted to look at not just, we looked at obviously correlation to high performance, which is something we do in all our studies, but we really did, looked at the data from organizations that felt like they had the frontline skills they needed versus those that don't, and looked at what differentiated those companies. So what were companies that feel like they have that skill pipeline to meet those needs? Um, th they were doing differently if they, what were they doing differently from those who felt like they weren't necessarily uh, having the frontline skills to be able to, to move their organization forward. Right. So here's our results and you see it's one third, two thirds, one third said yes at 34% and two thirds, 66% said no. So what are your thoughts on those results, Molly? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think it does show the maturity of this group because actually, if you look at the next slide, Tom, we and we asked this in our survey, about forty percent said they don't. So a little higher, um, a little bit higher with this group. But I think it's also uh, representative of people who are really thinking about this because obviously, if you're on this call, you sort of self-selected into making sure that your organization has this, and just a yes or no, um, you know, you have to lean one way or the other. But it's fairly on par, but a little bit more or individuals on the phone call want to learn more, obviously, about how organizations are upskilling that frontline workforce. Right. Yeah. But you're in good company. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that out there that are struggling with this issue. Yep, absolutely. So thank you, everyone, for participating in that. We'll have another poll here in just a couple of minutes as we start to walk through the findings from the study. But before we get into the findings, Molly, can you just set us up? You know, why did we do this study? Uh, I know we had a partner with it. You can talk about them a little bit. Um, just sort of kick us off with an overview here. 
Yeah, we've worked over the years and done a couple of different reports over the time that time with Upskill America, which is a part of the Aspen Institute. And they really came back to us after having done a study in 2018 and some other work with us in the meantime. And so we really want to understand the state of the state when it comes up to skilling frontline workers. They focus specifically on the U.S. market, but we actually broadened it and looked at the global market as well. So we had over 40 countries that participated in this study. And it was actually the project was started by my former colleague, Carol Morrison, who retired last year. I took it over when she uh, when she retired, but was really happy to work with her. She'd done a lot of our upskilling frontline worker research up to that point. So built on her foundation, but really happy to bring this to market as well, along with a number of different assets um, that came out of the study. Yeah, thanks for that call out to Carol. She was a longtime employee at I4CP, I think around 20 years. Uh, she probably wrote more case studies at I4CP than anyone else ever has. That was a specialty for her. I worked with her in our first go round with Upskill America many years ago. Um, great partner to work with. Uh, and certainly you took the, the study to, to the next level and to fruition as uh, when, she, when she left the organization. So call out to Carol if she's She's probably not listening in. She's probably enjoying <laughs> she's her probably retirement. She's enjoying but, her retirement somewhere. <laughs> right. But, uh, but wanted to mention not. that. Yeah. <laughs> So there were four key findings from this study, Molly. Um, uh, here's a little bit more uh, about it. Anything more you want to say about the about the study up front? Just if you are members, there are case studies, including uh, one on Target that we're going to mention later, available on the site. And also uh, Upskill America authored their own report just on the U.S. market on this data that's available on their website. So ours will look at the global data set, but theirs just looks at the U.S. So if you're interested in that, you can go check it out at Upskill America. Yeah, so two reports, one, one I believe there's open to the public, uh, ours yeah. available for, for members that dives a little bit deeper into correlations with market performance as we always do. Absolutely, that one just looked more at company size in the US market right. and what was different. All right, so as I said, there were four key findings. Why don't you give voice to each of these four and then and we're gonna walk through all four of these in a little bit of detail, but just give us give us the lay of the land here to start. Sure. So when we looked at the study, we really wanted to understand again what companies that were being more successful in upskilling their frontline employees were doing. And what we found is sort of one overall finding. And then we looked at what was the key findings for the different types of programs that we studied that we looked at. We'll cover those in a minute. But the first finding was that it really is about a multifaceted approach. There's no one intervention that's driving overall success with these programs. It really is a multifaceted approach that deals with where your organization is when it comes to skill building and where individuals are. And so within that finding about the need for multiple programs, we looked at um, successful internal formal educational programs, uh, need to be focused, cast a wide net and focus on both full and part-time positions. We saw that future ready organizations support workers through counseling and coaching as well as financially when it comes to tuition reimbursement and higher education. And when it came to apprenticeship programs, they all often are always offered advancement to full work time work upon completion. So these are some of the trends within those three pieces that we studied and how they how organizations were successful individually within those three different uh, types of intervention that we talked about, as well as overall the need to have to have multiple types. Yeah. So on that, um, that really is the, the first finding, the, the need to not just, you know, have one arrow in your quiver, so to speak, um, prioritizing frontline worker upskilling really does require and, and to really optimize it, a variety of educational programs. Um, let, let's dive into those. The, 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 these are the three that we studied and we'll go into in depth on, yeah. on each of these, but anything else you want to say sort of from a broad perspective? Yeah, I mean, the internal former educational training is really focused on the broad set of your what your individual organization needs to run and develop internally. So that's sort of what we mean by that. When we talk about tuition assistance, it's about paying for enrollment at third party institutions, but usually resulting in a degree or certification. And apprenticeship work and learn programs are really a combination of on the job training as well as classroom training that um, are used not only to upskill current employees and but to attract and diversify the pipeline of, of employees coming in from the outside of the organization. It's not only get you a bigger quantity of people in your pipeline, but more diverse talent within that pipeline as well. And we'll go into some detail about that. Yeah, it'll be good question, to go into... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Do we have a I question saw a question about how frontline workers are defined. Um, I don't Thank have the you. exact... Um, definition in front of me, but it's basically people who earn, I think it's under $40,000 a year and are individual contributors. 
So something like that. So sort of the frontline, um, not necessarily just entry level, but sort of the lower paid frontline workers who are um, yeah. often the people who interact with your best customers most often. Yeah, very think? often hourly paid, but not always. Like you said, they could be salaried, but just at, at a low pay rate usually. Yeah. Um, and they're individual contributors. Um, they're not, you know, ha having risen up into management or more senior positions. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we wanted to do another quick poll. We, we've just sort of high level introduced these three types of, of programs. Um, so we wanted to ask you all, does your organization have any of the following types of upskilling programs in place? I think most companies of, uh, you know, of a certain size have at least one of these. Um, they either have formal internal education programs, maybe they leverage TAP um, to help people get their associates or bachelor's degrees um, for those that don't have them already. And then apprenticeship work uh, is probably more concentrated in certain industries, but let's see what uh, folks on the call have to say. Let those answers filter in here for another few seconds. And this is again a multiple response. You could pick more than one, of course, because some organizations do offer all three. three. Yep, absolutely. And again, they can look different in different organizations, but um, and again, Just we talk about formal, level. yeah, and formal internal education. Right? Everyone's got some sort of training or education, even if it's just a manual and PDF you can hand to on day one, but. Right. Um, so here's That's the results. What are your what are your first thoughts here, Molly? Yeah, I mean, fairly similar to what we saw in the report, but I think it's interesting that we have a lot more people with tuition assistance programs on the phone than we had in our um, in our um, database for the study, um, which is interesting. But what we looked at within each of these types of programs, we looked at people who are achieving their goal, most su successfully achieving their goals, not just overall from frontline worker development, but for the individual program. So I think it'll be interesting to see, it's not just about having the program, but it's about what, how do you make sure that it's a program that's actually yielding your result, your goals for the program. Yeah, and both this study, the report you produced, and our previous work uh, that, that Carol and I did several years ago on upskilling, we really drilled into what can make TAP programs you know, more than a check the box offering, something that, you know, can can really be fruitful and, and people will, will want to have uptick. And I know you'll have some things to share on, on how you can drive that usage and drive the overall benefits here in, in a few minutes. And Nanette has a question about uptake of tuition assistance programs. Hold on to that question because we will definitely get to that. So we will dive into that. that. Yeah, that'll be our second, uh, second drill down. All right. So again, just at a high level, um, these were the numbers. You go ahead. Why don't you compare these, like you said, with what we just saw from, from the poll today? Yeah. I mean, fairly similar apprenticeships, you know, a little bit less than half of organizations uh, said they had those in place. More significant number had formal education programs and tuition assistance programs. But really, again, what the finding was in this area was not just do you have them, but are you more likely to having one or more makes you more likely to be a high performer. So it's about getting that multifaceted approach to, to achieve your overall goals when it comes to upskilling your talent. Yeah. I mean, if we add up these percentages, uh, it adds up to what, about 200%. So that would mean that the average organization, if I understand my math here, would have two out of these three uh, yep. in general. So if we did see sense. the more you had in place, the more likely you were to achieve the goal, your overall goals when it came to upskilling your frontline workforce. Yeah, that's the important correlation. Uh, having all three had an even stronger correlation. Having at least two was medium uh, and having only one had the lowest. So, yeah. Great finding. And having none made it really tough. <laughs> makes it tough. Makes it tough if you don't offer any development for your people, for sure. All right. So that's sort of the quickest of the, of the findings. Let's drill into each of these three now. Let's go into formal internal uh, L&D programs. Yeah, so uh, for each of these findings, you'll see we sort of have a little bit of a description of what the goals are. And so for this one, successful internal formal education and training programs, really having a broad focus, uh, not just full-time employees, part-time employees, realizing this is kind of a foundational piece to help your organization formalize what's important when it comes to upskilling frontline workers. So it's things that may be developed in-house specific to you, but really making sure you're getting as much impact as possible by widening the net of who those are offered to. Um, and again, the top two goals are around for these programs that we asked individuals specifically for these internal formal education and training programs, employee upskilling and addressing the broad needs of the workforce for the key goals. So it kind of fits with what the description is of that particular um, of those particular programs. 
And again, so, the most common uh, that we saw. Yeah, let, let me pause here because we've, we've got a little bit more information on this finding, but um, we're going to get to Ashley and Misty's questions on tuition assistance and college degrees in a moment. But Tanya has asked a good question, I think, for, for this area here. I'm curious as to how well organizations do in integrating the education they pay for into the roles. Um, can you say, speak yeah. about that? Well, that's, we'll talk about that in the next key finding as well, but it really is about, we found it's not just about paying for tuition reimbursement, it's really about surrounding people in, who are taking advantage of that into and encouraging them to take advantage of that and supporting them with how does this link to their individual goals as well as the organization's need going forward. So that's really what we saw. Uh, it's not just about having a tuition program that can check the box. We we reimburse you if you go out and find a program and we decide it's okay and you might have to pay for it and we'll pay you back and we'll go into some detail on that. But it really is about we're seeing the most success in those kind of programs when they're surrounded by coaching and assistance to right. be able to leverage that. Well, and I think that's important. I think Tanya was not just thinking uh, tuition assistance, but even here in, you know, internal formal education programs, having a e-learning library, having leadership development program, having, you know, anything that's relevant, functional training, uh, since we're talking frontline workers. Um, I mean, all, none of that is free usually. So it's right. things that they're also paying for. And so, as you were just saying, integrating it into the role, making sure the manager is involved, extra coaching that sort of surrounds the formal program. Did that come up in, in some of the conversations you've had with organizations? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's also to the sort of overall mindset of viewing talent leaders as as not being hoarders of talents, not being blockers of talent, but really seeing that encouraging people to learn more and offering them more learning programs is an investment in your future as opposed to a cost to be managed. And that's really a mindset flip. I, mean, I think especially tuition assistance, it's easy to think of it as an employee benefit that costs you something as opposed to an investment in your organization's future. And I think that applies to all three, but that's something we saw as well. Yeah, that I'm glad you brought up uh, the, the issue of, of managers hoarding talent. I mean, that, that happens at all levels. That happens with folks with, with higher level employees. I'm sure it happens a lot with frontline workers as well. And it's human nature. Uh, it's difficult to have to replace people uh, no matter what level or, or role we're talking about. Um, but that's come up multiple times in I4CP studies over the years. We did a talent mobility study in 2016. We did a workforce readiness study that encompasses internal mobility in, in 2021. I, I personally led that one. And in both cases, about 40% of survey participants said they have a real problem with managers hoarding talent instead of developing their people and, and looking to move them around the organization. So it's it's a it's an ongoing problem. I think if we were to ask the question today, it probably hasn't budged much from that 40%. Uh, so yeah. I'm glad, glad and, you raised that. And in preparation for this, I did a little bit of Googling and actually found, that, I mean, sort of just the general gestalt out there says that it costs less to upskill a current employee than it is to hire a new one. But I actually found estimates of the cost ranging between 70 and uh, high, developing current employees versus hiring can save anywhere from 70 to 92 percent. So pretty wide range there, but it just really goes to show you that there is a big impact and a reason to leverage that investment of upskilling current employees. Yeah. We do have a question here from, I believe, Deepa. What are the best practices for integrating both the soft skills training, so-called soft or power skills, and technical skills uh, when you're doing, as we're focusing here, internal training for frontline workers? Did that come up in, in some of your interviews? Yeah, and actually, if you go to the next slide, Tom, we actually looked at what differentiated, uh, again, those organizations that's high success in achieving their internal education program goals versus those in the lighter blue here with the low success. And these are the ones where we saw the biggest differentiation. So they aren't around the technical skills. They really are more around those soft skills, around communication, social relational, so critical thinking and positive mental well-being. So we certainly saw that while technical skills are important, we also saw the differentiation in organizations who are achieving their goals for these programs. We're focusing a bit more on some of these soft skills. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, the technical training or functional training, like how to get the tasks done is sort of the obvious thing. That's the low hanging fruit, particularly for frontline workers, if they can't literally work the machines or uh, you know, enter data into the systems, whatever the tasks they have are, um, then they literally just can't be functional on the job. Um, so that that's sort of table stakes. But these these areas, 
some of these would be also very relevant for at least some frontline workers, communication skills, social relational skills. If you're interacting directly with customers, which is often the case with frontline workers, um, then it would make sense that offering more training, really focusing on this. These aren't huge deltas between the high success and low success organizations, but enough to, to draw our attention. Yeah, and the trend when you look at them in total, which is say these softer leading skills are all um, more likely to be in place in high success programs, you start to get a, a sense of the trend. Yeah, and oftentimes these are would, would all be parts of one overall soft skills program where you're focusing on each of these, say, one day at a time or one hour at a time. So bundling them, them together, these you know even these modest differences would really add up. Yeah. I just saw a question about the 70 to 92% stat. That mm -hmm. was from a number of different sources, but I kind of looked at I in the Google machine. It was some AI help that I did verify after <laughs> after uh, getting information. I asked um, what was the cost difference between upskilling a current worker versus replacing that worker. And the numbers are kind of got range for that 70 to 92% savings when it came to developing and upskilling a current employee. I wanted to just also call out while we're still looking at this data, um, the biggest delta, 9% uh, difference, but also just ratio wise, 23% versus 14%. The one at the bottom, positive yeah. mental well being habits. I, I have a feeling based on all the research we've done, including previously mentioned Carol Morrison, who led our well being study several years ago, early on during the pandemic. Um, I have a feeling that that maybe these numbers would have been a little bit higher for both the high success and low success, say two, three years ago when well-being was sort of the big focus, the thing that that all organizations were focusing on. You led our, our productivity predicament study uh, last year, Molly. We've seen the pendulum sort of swing back towards, uh, I think we found in that study, accountability, responsibility, actually getting you know results on the job. But I don't think it's ever going to go back to pre-pandemic stages. I think there's still this this interest in in uh, in making sure employees, frontline employees included, uh, have strong well-being habits. Can you speak speak to that one a little bit? Yeah, and for good reason. I mean, because we've all seen what happened. I mean, the trauma, collective trauma coming out of COVID and things like that. We started to focus on it, but I think we we run the risk of swinging the pendulum too far back in terms of not realizing the impact of burnout on white collar workers as well as blue collar workers. We talked about frontline workers in the context of, of the pandemic being nurses, things like that. But also there's an article just this week that's pointed out to us by a colleague on Bank of America and how it's ignoring its overtime rules and grinding its investment, low level investment bankers into the ground with these hundred hour work weeks. You know, they're getting fatigued and they're managing their money. You know, they're gonna make mistakes. I remember seeing a study quite a few years ago looking at the car accident rates of surgeon of doctors who've been on call for more than 10 hours versus those other, you know, versus the general trend. And it was a significantly higher. And that was just people who got into car accidents on their way home from the shift. That doesn't even look at any potential medical, you know, mistakes right. that were made. So I think we're really starting to view this idea of well-being and not just fatigue management, but sort of overall helping people manage their well-being as a focus into the future, because it really is, you know, it's not just about pilots we think about, or, you know, nuclear work, engineer workers. It's really everyone that needs to be able to have tools to manage their time and their well-being. Yeah, we've seen some data too from Dan Pink and other thought leaders out there in the business world that have looked into different times of day, as you were saying, in the medical field. Uh, there are certain times that you're you're better or or less well off going into the ER based on yeah. you know average shift times and things like that. But even things that are less life and death, like just going to the grocery store and interacting with a cashier, say if you don't use the self checkout, um, I I often find that uh, when someone's first starting their shift, if I find that out, they're they're much more friendly and, and helpful. Uh, if they're about to end their shift, they're also usually pretty friendly and helpful. But if they're about two thirds of the way through, uh, if I learn that, that's when I find they may be a little bit more on the grumpy side. And it's, I was thinking about that because that's, are you going to be more likely to go back to that store or go to a right. store that, you know, another store where maybe the conditions allow people to take different, different break schedules or even right. just manage their time. It's interesting. One of the areas that I've explored quite a bit in the past and I find fascinating is scheduling and well-being. We think about scheduling and, and time and attendance being very technical and sort of, you know, when people show up and it's a very non-human facing you know, type of thing. We think of it as something a machine can spit out or, or a manager writes down and just hands over to people. We've actually seen in studies here and uh, that I've led elsewhere 
that really look at giving people some flexibility to manage their time. Even things like, hey, somebody's really dissatisfied at work because they have to be there at 8.30, but their kid's daycare doesn't open until 8.45. Right. And if they can make some changes like that, they can still work their eight hours or you know, you can find ways for them to manage their time. It can really help manage their satisfaction, which can, which can drive customer satisfaction, which we all know can drive revenue. Right. Yeah. One of the organizations we're going to highlight later, because we did a case study with them is Target. One of the things they've developed is a uh, scheduling app that is available on employees' mobile phones that allows folks to exchange time slots with each other without manager approval in some cases, right. if they're an equivalent employee, frontline employee, um, you know, just shows up who, who they can change times with. And, and that can help a lot with well-being too. And it takes something that turns what would have been a headache for the manager when they showed up for their shift is having to find a replacement into something that's a benefit to the employees to be able to switch easily and to be able to say, hey, look, I got Taylor Swift tickets for tomorrow night. You know, right. can, I, can I find somebody to swap with? All right. Lastly here, before we move on to TAP programs, um, uh, the third key finding, um, I wanted to just call out Tanya again in the chat who said, you know, can we reframe and stop using the term soft skills to define the skills in that sort of bucket that we all understand what that category is. Um, they're actually the hardest skills to learn and master. Several people have chimed in with with agreement on that. Um, that's why earlier I, I sort of refer to them as soft skills or often called power skills. One person here in the chat said they, they just call it development training to get away from the sort of negative connotation of so-called softness. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Molly? This has been going on in, in the industry yeah. for a while now, this, this desire to have a, a new term. Well, it's one of those things where I totally agree and wish we'd stop calling them soft skills, and then I do it myself all the time. So do as I say, not as I do, I guess. But I agree, yeah. they are the hardest ones to learn. But I think it's also important to realize they can be taught, they can be learned. And that's why it's important to focus on them, because they're not something that comes naturally to everyone. You know, sometimes you get people who are promoted to a manager position or who just naturally understand how to communicate. They know how to manage people. They know how to manage their time. They know how to self-regulate. But if they don't, those are things that can be taught. You don't just have to hope they get better and sort of not talk about it. Those are actually are programs that are important because they're difficult to learn. But if you just ignore them, they're gonna it's gonna get even worse. So I think yeah. it's uh, we do need to make it part of our development training. It needs to be the core of kind of what we think about. It's it's the ability to think critically, the ability to communicate are all essential to learning all these other skills that we want people to learn. So I agree, and I need to be better, but. Yeah. Well, what I find is because soft skills is such a ubiquitous term, like I say, I like to say soft skills or so-called power skills, use both terms and, and yeah. that will help nudge us as an industry toward, towards using the other terminology. And I want to note too, the, the, the power of nudges and with all of this sort of training, what you're really wanting is for people to develop new habits. And we've had a lot of great science from Charles Duhigg and, and many others that have popularized this, these studies on the power of habits the power of nudges. And so oftentimes it's not just a go to a class or take an e-learning program on some of the, the soft skills. It's do that, yes, to get the baseline knowledge and understanding the benefits, um, but then have a system of coaching, a system of nudges, uh, a system of, of habit formation around these skills. And that's where it can really stick. Yep. And it's because we're talking about frontline workers, but certainly when it comes to coaching, nudging coaches to have those conversations with frontline workers <laughs> can have a big impact because it's all, all right. connected. Absolutely. All right, let's move on. I'm um, looking at the clock here. We're doing good on time, but key finding three was all about tuition assistance. So walk us through this, Molly. Yeah. So again, as we've mentioned before, this funding was all about, it's not just offering the program, but it's also offering the assistance around it, supporting employees getting degrees or certifications, making it sort of a, a cultural norm to say, hey, we, we appreciate that people are going to this and also really helping managers understand that they, and even putting in rewards for managers or, or incentives for managers to be, um, to be given them, you know, highlight them for their good behavior, if you will, by encouraging people to do this. So again, it's not just about having a program that says reimburse tuition, but it's about creating that mindset around it. And then there are also some very specific things that we saw highly correlated to success with tuition programs on the next slide, but it really is about, again, changing that mindset to view leaders and as a view your organization as a grower of talent. And it can even be a thing to help you attract people as well as retain people. 
But yeah, we saw, I mean, these six items I love because they're really all about taking down those barriers, Tom. And I know you and I have talked about this, but you know, allowing eligible employees to participate on the first day of employment, supplying coaching and advisory services, allowing eligible, eligible employees to participate without the approval or dispensation of their direct managers, providing direct payment for tuition to the school so that someone doesn't have to front the money themselves and then get paid back later. Dropping GPA and grade requirements that must be sustained, eliminating clawback policies. These are all about taking down those hurdles. And again, viewing investment in upskilling when, when it comes to external credentials, whether those be high school degrees, college degrees, associates, or certificate programs, viewing it as an investment in the future of your organization's talent pool as opposed to a cost or, or an employee benefit that you're sort of required to pay out. Right. Three of these really have to do with accessibility of the program, making it more accessible, the allowing eligible employees to participate from the first day of employment, um, participating without approval or dispensation from their manager. And then especially, I think, and this is one that we've had multiple studies on over the years when Carol and I worked with Upskill America before we found this to be true, providing direct payment for tuition on workers' behalf ahead of time, rather than providing uh, you know, reimbursement where the where yeah. the employee has to front the cost. We're talking about frontline workers here in particular. It'd be one thing if we were talking about highly paid mid, middle management or or engineers, but we're talking about frontline workers who, as you said, typically make forty thousand dollars a year or less, maybe maybe a little bit more, but you know, they may be part time workers. For them to have to front the the tuition cost and then be reimbursed, it may be just a non starter right off the bat. Absolutely, because if you're making that kind of money, if you're supporting a family, you know, a thousand dollars can be a lot to kind of um, to come up with in, in advance. And I'll say, actually, my um, my husband did a, a executive MBA program towards the beginning of his career, and interestingly, he found a program that actually packaged the whole thing so that all your tuition as well as your books and supplies were into one lump sum so that it was easier to get reimbursed by the program. So finding whether you have an association with those programs or help people find those kind of programs where it's all in one lump sum that makes it easier for, and cheaper for you to reimburse because you don't have to deal with multiple accounting uh, steps, things like that can be really uh, beneficial as well. But yeah, just taking down that barrier of saying, I have to find this hundred or thousand or five thousand dollars for this program and wait to be reimbursed can make a huge difference in accessibility. Right. Another one that's interesting here is, is generating a little bit of discussion in the chat, and that's dropping GPA yeah. grade requirements, which employees must meet in order to continue enrollment. So once they've gotten over any access accessibility hurdles that we were just talking about, they've gotten there, can they stay in the program? We've got uh, a few folks in the chat that, that are wondering about maybe not dropping it entirely, but changing it to just pass fail, um, or yeah. maybe lowering the requirements might be good, but not dropping them entirely. What are your thoughts on that, Molly? We did ask the question, but my intuition says maybe that's the right answer, but I think it goes to that coaching and support idea too, which is to say, if they're great, if their GPA drops, it may not just be a say, saying to them, hey, you're cut off. But really work, especially their high potential, potentially, or potential, potentially, um, you know, to make sure you're keeping talent you want, having a conversation with them about why and how we can support them. Or maybe it's a one strike kind of situation where at least you have, if you start to dip below certain right. thresholds, you can have that kind of support and conversation because it may, there may be something going on that could be resolved. And right. that would let them get, get them back on track. Get them back on track. And also when it comes to engagement, if you feel like you're not, I mean, the, the payment is one thing, but it's very easy to quickly overlook the payment. If you're the one who has to go to class every Thursday night and Friday night and on all day Saturday, it's very easy to overlook the money. But if you feel like your company's giving you that ongoing support, it actually makes the most of your investment because the money, once the money's paid the first time, you know, that sort of psychologically does not impact you as much as the ongoing support and having your manager or having development conversations around, you know, hey, this is preparing you for this next role or this next opportunity. Yeah, agreed. So I think a uh, point well taken from some of those in the chat. We don't want to yeah. say that, you know, zero accountability from the learner themselves, the employee is what we're suggesting here. But um, but I think tying together as you just did the the maybe lowering, if not dropping entirely the grade requirements and tying that with the support from the organization, particularly the coaching advisory services, um, which was another one of these these uh, findings here, um, one of these six, uh, I think that might be, you know, the, the winning strategy. And on that one, I wanted to add coaching and advisory sort of wraparound support services. That's something that we've seen in many of our studies comes up often in, with regard to onboarding, performance management, succession management, uh, and, and more. 
Um, anything else you want to add on that? I mean, you already called it out in relation to the other one, but uh, it just seems like such a powerful, important aspect of having a truly successful TAP, TAP initiative. Yeah, and I think that's what we're asking the individuals who invest their time in studying outside of work. It does add a little bit of workload to their managers and to people who are having development conversations and even to the L&D organization, potentially. It does take some investment. But again, if you switch that mind to that to say we are investing in upskilling our talent as opposed to we're providing a benefit that's a benefit to the employee only, right? Which is what I think we think about employee benefits, things that cost us money and that we give to our employees. This is the mindset shift of saying this is really an investment in individuals that help them get to their goals and us get to our goals. Having that mindset shift will make it the fact that it's not just the employees have to invest in it and, and do a little bit of extra work, but also the employers. Um, we had a, a, a question from Ashley in the chat that I'd like to encourage folks to respond to in the chat. She asked, are you all starting to add certifications to your tuition program? So if anyone has or um, you know, has any insights to add there, please please do so in the chat. I'm sure she'd love to hear some responses. Um, I'll, I'll just, just note- say quickly, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I'll just no, say in don't. conversation and things like that, yes, we're seeing that more because people are going to skills-based. And so it's not about having a degree to get a job, it's about having skills. So we're seeing a lot more certification programs and we'll, we'll see as time to switch to Key Finding Four, a lot of the um, apprenticeship and tuition and uh, work to learn programs are being tied to, um, certifications as well. Yeah. So before we jump to, to key finding four, I just want to also follow up on that certifications, um, but also sort of less formal badging programs. A lot of learning management systems or LXP platforms support this. And um, we've seen some very large organizations do very extensive badging programs with great success, like like EY, the financial services consulting firm. Um, so that's also something to consider, not just for your corporate employees, but for frontline workers, particularly if those badges can maybe roll up into uh, you know, something, something a little bit bigger than that. Maybe the badges are incrementally rolling up into a certification, that sort of thing. All right, let's, let's take a look at our last key finding. Then I know we wanna talk through a couple of quick case studies that were involved yeah. in this study as well. Absolutely. So key finding four may seem like a little bit of a, you know, duh, or a motto is on your master of the obvious. Successful pr apprenticeship programs often are always offer advancement to full-time work. You know, you think about the oldest definition of apprentices, right? Maybe blacksmithing or something like that, where the apprentice would learn from the master and then eventually take over the master's, you know, shop, if you will. But the reason this was an interesting finding is because the number of low success programs that didn't actually link these to jobs was astounding to me. Mm. The fact that people were investing at all in these programs, even if they were very, very low, you know, sort of simple types of programs, they, they weren't mapping it to a job on the other end seemed really odd to me. So I just wondering, you know, that's kind of why we call it this finding because making sure they link to jobs is really important. But what's also interesting about this this finding of these type of programs is that this is the only one where we start to see a third goal pop up. So the reason people are investing in apprenticeship and work to learn programs is to not only upskill employees and improve talent retention, but that middle bullet improve and or diversify talent pipelines. And we had a case from Microsoft, um, Micron that you'll see later in the presentation about this, but it really is about how do you have non-traditional pathways into, um, into certain jobs? I mean, nobody has the knowledge to, as a little kid to say, I want to grow up and be in the semiconductor industry and work as a technician in a clean room. Like that's not a dream that you have when you're four years old. So how do we make people aware of these kind of opportunities and the fact these are really good jobs and connect mm -hmm. them to the skilling, whether it's, you know, in vocational high schools or in community college programs, organizations are investing in these third parties as well and helping things like uh, Micron, for example, funded a clean room environment for a lab in in community colleges and areas where they're looking to upskill, where they're looking to hire in the next few years. So, and then pathing those people into their organization. So really it's about, and they're also using it to target, you know, they're looking at moms who might be working, they could have a manufacturing job if it was within um, school hours, you know, things like that, or working dads, um, you know, different populations of disability community, uh, communities of color. So it's, they're also being able to target these programs and put them in places where you can teach people, hey, maybe I do want to work in a semiconductor clean room when I grow up. <laughs> yeah, nice combination of goals here, things that sort of lean towards uh, helping the employee, uh, and, and then those that overlap with helping the organization, improving talent retention, improving their di diversification, their talent pi pipeline numbers. So Great, yep. great combination there. 
Say a little bit more about some of these details uh, on on apprenticeship and and so-called work to learn programs. In the U.S., the Department of Labor has a really strong definition of what an approved, a registered apprenticeship program needs to have. This part of the right state, right from their um, Office of Apprenticeship at the Department of Labor's website. And they have to contain wage progression. You know, you have to be making more money as you upskill. They have to have skilled supervision. So again, apprentices are with masters, so to speak. That's not what they call it, but someone who knows what they're doing. They have skilled supervision on the job learning. So learning by actually doing, but also partnered with technical or classroom learning. And they have to result in a nationally recognized credential. So, but what we found is whether or not you actually have your apprentice program registered wasn't as important as if you hewed to these five sort of uh, requirements. So even if you don't go through every step to become a registered U.S. uh, Department of Labor apprenticeship program, using these as sort of your guidelines for developing an apprentice program makes you much more likely to be successful. Nice. So it's a great checklist. It's a great track to run on if you're looking to develop an apprenticeship program. Like you say, whether you go through the the hurdles of getting it officially registered may or may not be in your organization's interest. Um, We don't have data on that, but hewing to, as you said, to these five areas uh, definitely improves the the value of the program. And again, that credential, it's all about being able to not just prove for the individual, not just get the job for you for today, but also spreading the wealth in terms of making a credential is recognized across other jobs and throughout the industry and making them more employable overall and creating a broader set of skills in the marketplace that people can then um, look for. Those yeah, and there's particularly some areas that involve apprenticeship. There's a real shortage of, of workers. We've had in a culture of, of uh, college expectations in, in the United States and in other parts of the world. Uh, and that's actually driven a, a sort of deficit of, of workers in various fields. Welding is, is one that famously comes up in a lot of conversations uh, and apprenticeships can really help in a lot of these areas. Yeah, and I think we sort of are conversations about dirty jobs. I don't know if it's still big. They're still making episodes. Many of us, I'm sure, remember right, this Mike show. Mike Rowe show, yeah. Mike Rowe would go into these sort of so-called dirty jobs, but they often were great jobs, but people, they weren't didn't necessarily require a college degree. But so we need to open people's eyes that just having a college degree, I mean, not just, it's a huge accomplishment, but that's not the only path to a successful career. And that it's much, you may be able to spend two years in an associate or certificate program that gives you the skills to launch into a great career and then maybe also eventually get your college degree. But so breaking it down, I know you've done a lot of work with this, Tom, on skills-based um, jobs, but how do you actually break it down to the skills that may or may not require four years at an undergraduate university? Yeah, we, we've seen that as an ongoing trend um, for, you know, all sorts of different jobs, relooking at, at so-called knowledge worker jobs. Some of those don't necessarily require a college degree. Uh, but certainly for a lot of frontline workers, um, the the artificial requirement of requiring that something like an apprenticeship program or a certificate um, is, is often, you know, all that's required. Yeah. All right. Let's let's pivot in our last uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, there were several sort of case examples and case studies. The biggest one uh, that was a separate write up, a separate case study was with Target. Walk us through some of the, the key findings from that from that discussion. Yeah, and again, um, I credit to to Carol Morrison for getting this case study really pulled together. But um, one of the things that Target really is a great example of is taking that multifaceted approach. If anyone heard their next practices weekly call they did a couple of weeks ago with Tom, um, they really did look at these all three of these types of programs, bring them together to create their approach to upskilling frontline workers. They just put the the case in. Um, in the the chat there. But what they found was interesting is they actually saw that uh, in certain learning programs that the people who participated had been promoted up to three times more than colleagues who didn't participate. So they're seeing promotion rates go up. They also saw an impressive 70% lower turnover rate among people who participated in some of their programs. So they saw some great impact. But what was also interesting on the next slide, if you go to some of their key takeaways, Target's a big company. There's a lot of jobs at that company. And one of the things they really used to um, to steer their programs was they had to keep focused. They Their goal was equitable access to meaningful careers. And they used that lens. And if things didn't fall within that lens, um, they were kept out of scope. And they mm. also said they were about progress, not perfection. So they knew they had so many jobs. They weren't going to figure out the skills 
taxonomy for every single role, but they were going to focus on the big ones first to make progress, even if they couldn't get to every single role in their first go around. And also, again, that culture, um, providing the foundation for success. This quote here, we have a culture that's very movement centric. Leaders don't hoard talent. That makes it possible for team members to move up. So they really, they were a great case to talk about how organizations are bringing together all those pieces. I love those takeaways. The Progress, not perfection. Um, I love the the you know staying focused, uh, don't, not getting distracted by you know adding everything into the program. And then boy, the the, the ultimate metric there seventy percent lower uh, turnover rate uh, for participants. When you think about um, frontline super. workers, that can be huge because frontline yeah, workers I are target mean, retail workers. We always hear horror stories about turn. The only thing higher, I think, is fast casual dining. <laughs> yes, yeah, super high turnover rates, often over a hundred percent on an annual basis. So to be able to drop that by seventy percent would is is a huge uh, huge result. Yeah. All right, target wasn't the only one. Um, you you walk through some of these before we move on to the others. Is there anything else that you see here that you want to? just call attention to? Yeah, I mean, these are all kind of quotes from our source there at Target, but again, it was about empowering the team. Um, you know, I like this one to aim for balance. Organizations get stuck on basic skills because it can be overwhelming, but really going deeper. And I like they describe themselves as a scrappy progress over perfection approach. You know, they knew they weren't going to figure it all out. So they really want to focus on the most important. I think I really think that takeaway progress over perfection is really one to be thinking about because it can be overwhelming. But if you focus on here's what we're going to do first, you know, that allows you to get some quick wins and also build on that as you go to the future. Don't let the overwhelming totality of it stop you from starting. Stop you from starting. Yeah, some, some great takeaways here. And I do want to remind everyone, someone asked this earlier in the chat and Zeta noted um, that as with all next practice weekly sessions, the slide deck from today, all of these findings, these quotes that you see here, which which are really solid, um, the the PDF of these slides will be made available along with the recording of today's call uh, within 48 hours of us uh, concluding today. So watch for that. You can download this if if you're interested in improving your your TAP program, your apprenticeships, whatever it may be. Um, these slides will all be available for you. All right, so we've only got a few minutes left, um, but uh, Target wasn't the only organization that we highlighted in the report. Uh, I know you've mentioned Micron earlier, but uh, let's talk a little bit about Verizon. Yeah, Verizon actually was an example of a next practice from one of our previous studies, which was that providing advancement and readiness outside the organization was a key next practice, one that's five times more likely to uh, take place in high-performance organizations. So this idea of making sure that the yeah, job profiles are understood inside and outside the company. They were a great example of that and kind of building the case for upskilling programs. And then our next one, Medtronic, who I actually am very fond of, if only because they make the devices implanted in my brain that, <laughs> that manages my Parkinson's. So go Micron or go Medtronic. But yeah. they also have done some interesting stuff when it comes to um to their frontline skills, they created something called the Medtronic Advancement Pathways and Skill Building Program in 2001. And they're all about supporting employees with high quality upskilling and career pathways. And I love this quote um, that we got from Kristen. For a long time, we had traditional tuition reimbursement programs we realized need to be more flexible, affordable option. We needed to provide people with career paths and opportunities to upskill. So a great example of providing that coaching and and advisory around the um, around the, the the program itself when it comes to tuition reimbursement. Yeah, providing the coaching and advisory and also just, you know, providing as much support as possible and just showing uh, over time, you know, people uh, joining in. I love the 60% increase in participation figure there highlighted over on the right. And yeah, great really shout helps. out for, for you personally with Medtronic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> always, always nice when we can connect personally with, with one of our case examples. Absolutely. And also, I will say, I mean, like their Medtronic rep from who serves New England for these types of devices, I have a cell phone number in my phone, so I can tell you they have great frontline workers. <laughs> nice. Even better. So, um, and Micron, who we mentioned before, we actually had a speaker from Micron at our Next Practices conference back in March this year. And it really opened my eyes to what they're doing is creating these non-traditional and traditional pathways to employment and career mobility. Because again, being in the semiconductor industry, it's an important industry. There's some great paying jobs, but it's not what people naturally think of. And so by partnering with the community, which I think is going to be how we have to look at the overall shortage of talent you know, globally and, and across the country, how do we partner between 
individual organizations and the greater community and community institutions and really invest in those to make sure we have a talent pipeline. And so they're really doing it to expand the numbers, but also the diversity of their pipeline. Yeah, I remember that presentation. I believe the recording of that's probably available for I4CP members. Uh, I think most of our conference sessions are, are available by now up on our website, um, maybe a few exceptions, but um, I really love what you just emphasized there, the diversity of the pipeline. I just want to read out um, the, the end of the second paragraph there on the right. Micron is particularly focused on programs that attract talent who typically don't see STEM, especially tech jobs, as accessible to them, and that includes women, veterans, people from rural communities, and K-12 through students who don't know about semiconductor industry jobs as a potential career path. Um, you mentioned that earlier with people, you know, four-year-olds typically not dreaming of, of being in a, in a white lab coat working on semiconductors, although some might. Some, some might. Yeah. Some early computer lovers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just think that, that that's a very powerful, and I remember that session from our conference well. It really ties in the fact this is a learning program uh, but also really tied into your employer brand as well as your employee ability to attract talent. So it really does come full circle. Yeah, it's part of the EVP, the employer brand, even even could come up in your ESG reports, uh, the, the social yeah. aspect, your community support for sure. I love Mike, well, right. a four year old want we... HR jobs. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I say, you guys have the hard work. You have to do HR. I only have to write about HR. So yeah, nice. Love that. Um, all right. And we've got two minutes left. Um, walk us through the final overall recommendations from yeah. this study, Mom. I won't go into detail. You can read the slide and you can download it later, but I will say what they kind of boiled down to for me are, again, casting that wide net internally and externally, making sure you're including as many people in the organization as well as the workforce as a whole in your programs as are feasible. So really don't just make this for a select few, broaden the approach. Um, consider an investment, not a benefit cost. Again, you know, you're investing in an investment you want to guard, you want to make sure you're watching, you know, it's not something you set and forget, it's not something you check off and say, hey, we sent someone to a program. Making it a learning culture that doesn't tolerate talent blockers or talent hoarders. And again, if your jobs require key skills, support your current staff to get there. I mean, those numbers, anywhere between 70 and 92% less cost to upskill a current worker than it is to get a new to hire a new one. You we've heard about that with the customer acquisition costs. You know, how much less does it cost to keep a happy customer than it does to acquire new ones? Very similar when it comes to employees. Yes, development costs versus acquisition costs. Well, thank you so much, Molly. This has been Absolutely. a great whirlwind tour of this, uh, one of our major quarterly studies that we've done here at I4CP. Again, thank you to our partner in Upskill America. But great job, Molly. Appreciate all your insights today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And you're getting lots of kudos over in the chat. <laughs> Want to remind everyone that all I4CP Next Practices weekly calls are available for recertification credit hours. So if you have a cert from either HRCI or SHRM, just jot down the relevant program ID or activity ID that you see on the screen or grab it from the chat where Zeta has put those numbers up. Uh, and again, Next Practices weekly will be back on the next three weeks. As I said earlier, we have some outstanding guests coming up from Boys and Girls Club of America, Dow Chemical, and Advocate Health. Uh, until then, have a great rest of your week uh, and weekend coming up, and we'll see you again next week. Bye now. Take care, everyone.